present. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Amtum Abu Dhabi Legal Affairs Committee and Women in Business Committee joint webinar, The Power of Diversity, Equality and Inclusion in the Legal Profession. Our joint webinar is delivered in partnership with UPS. Amjam Abu Dhabi is platinum member and strategic partner of the Women in Business Committee. And Amjam Abu Dhabi platinum members, Raising Emirates and Accenture. As Liz mentioned, my name is Christina Strola. I am the Vice President of Public Affairs for UPS for the Indian subcontinent, Middle East and Africa. And as well, I'm a proud member of the Amjam Abu Dhabi and a co-chair of the Amjam Women in Business Steering Committee. There's absolutely no better time to host such an important event. Research studies increasingly show that diversity, equality, and inclusion can help increase a business bottom line, drive innovation, attract more talent, and create more opportunities for growth. And so it comes as no surprise that over the past few years, organizations have become more motivated to implement diversity, equality, and inclusion initiatives within the workplaces. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to my Women in Business and Legal Affairs Committee colleague, Courtney Sader. Courtney is a general counsel at Raytheon Emirates, and she will be your panel moderator for today's event. I hope you will enjoy the next one hour packed with exciting insights, interesting strategies, personal stories, useful tips, and much more from our leaders in the legal field who are joining us today from the UK, the US, and the UAE. My hope is for you to gain a better understanding on how you can advance diversity, equality, and inclusion within your own organizations, but also how to best embed DNI into your respective company cultures. Again, thank you so much for being part of this event and for joining us today. Courtney, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Christina, and thank you to everyone for joining the call today. I'm excited to be here. As Christina said, my name is Courtney Sater. I'm the general counsel for Raytheon Emirates. I'm also the general counsel for Raytheon Saudi Arabia. I'm honored to be moderating this event, which is being hosted by the AmCham Legal Affairs Committee, as well as the AmCham Women and Business Committee to facilitate an open discussion about the power of diversity, equality, and inclusion in the legal profession. We're focusing today on the impact of DEI initiatives within the legal community, but the messaging from today's event has much broader applicability. I want to welcome the panelists. We have an esteemed group of speakers today from public and private sector with representatives from the government, in house, law firms, and large multinational private companies. So I'd first like to ask each of the panelists to provide a short introduction about themselves. Crystal, let's start with you. Thank you, Courtney. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here with you. Um, my name is Crystal Contreras. Um, so my day job within the legal organization at Accenture is the change management director, so responsible for all of our transformational programs. And the role that I play in legal IND is I'm a part of our IND advisory committee globally who drives the IND strategy specifically for legal um, which is, is a wonderful opportunity for me, able, for me to be able to participate in. And I guess personally, I am a second generation Mexican-American, originally from the US and currently residing in the UK. So it's wonderful to meet you and I look forward to this time together. Thanks so much, Crystal. Jennifer, can you give us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I would first like to start off by saying how excited and really just honored I am to be participating in this panel today on such an important topic um, that I'm personally passionate about. Um, so thank you for hosting the conversation and for having me. Um, as Courtney said, my name is Jennifer Curtis. I am an attorney in the corporate legal department of UPS. I've been with UPS for about four and a half years and my current responsibilities are primarily focused on managing our commercial contract engagements in the customer technology and e-commerce space. Um, I also have the pleasure of currently serving as chair of our legal diversity and inclusion committee. So again, it's really just a, a privilege to be able to participate in this panel today. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you. Mark, over to you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Devani. I am a partner and intellectual property lawyer at Card Co here in the UAE. Um, I also sit on our Regional Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And yes, I am aware that I am a white middle-aged man. Um, so maybe not the most obvious person to see on here, but hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll see that I am passionate about this topic and I'm very happy to join such a great group of people on this, on this call. 
Thanks so much. And Danielle, last but not least, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danielle Kenny. I am a lawyer and head of the Shared Services Corporate Support Team at ADNOC, based in Abu Dhabi. Um, so I've worked with ADNOC for around six years now, and I've been in the region for 13 years. Um, so as part of my role at ADNOC, I look at appointing external counsel. I'm involved in the recruitment of the, the legal team across our ADNOC group, and I'm also um, actively involved in some of our wider corporate strategies around diversity and inclusion. So again, I'm really delighted to be here here and, and have some really interesting discussions on this topic. Great, certainly an esteemed group of panelists. Thanks for the introductions. Just so all, everyone knows, we've, revert, we've reserved some time at the end of the discussion today for Q&A. So please, if you have questions as we go along, just feed them into the chat function and we'll bring those up at the end. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. So Crystal, let's start off with you. Can you please share with us what Accenture's program is for <coughs> diversity and inclusion within the legal profession? Uh, yes, absolutely. So just for a bit of context, um, so obviously Accenture is a multinational and our legal department is, is an in-house one, but we are, we're quite sizable. So we about, have about 3,000 legal professionals globally in 40 countries. And in the Middle East, we've got about 25 legal professionals and nine specifically in, in Saudi Arabia. So. So quite a breadth of uh, colleagues around the world. And I guess it's also noteworthy to say, um, if, you, if you're not aware, um, our CEO is, is female, um, previously a partner in a law firm. So also quite passionate and invested in the work that we do in IND specifically within legal. So that's all goodness and has really helped us um, you know, stay focused in this space. Um, I just one point around governance, which I think is important. I think Mark alluded to, you know, having being a part of an advisory committee. So we, our general counsel is our executive sponsor and really sets the tone from the top and um, our strat strategic direction. We also have a central legal IND advisory committee, which is really a working group to drive that strategy forward. So a, a good cross-discipline team of our IND leadership who is um, like a head litigator by day, but then also our HR business partner, director of operations, changing communications, and um, someone from the office of our general counsel. So really a group that is motivated and driving forward a lot of our programs. We also have legal ERGs. So um, in addition to the, the ERGs and communities that might sit in certain geographies, we have some that are dedicated to, um, to our legal professionals. So focused again on, on kind of the typical areas within IND, but then for gender and ethnicity, we have almost like market teams and market sponsors who have a more local agenda. So Francesca, who's, who's a part of your board, um, you know, is, is really a champion in particularly in the gender space um, for, um, for our legal community. And in terms of the key programs that we run as part of our strategy, um, I'll just name a handful. So we have our Mansfield um, diversity certification in the US, UK um, that I'll be speaking more about later. Um, our outside council diversity program, um, which is uh, just a few years on, but very focused on, on how we can collaborate with our law firms to drive diversity in the industry at large. Um, we have an MD priorities um, program, which basically is um, a performance priority for all 70 of our managing directors that they're held accountable for at the end of the year in terms of outcome and impact and how they are supporting our um, IND agenda. Um, so really just trying to drive the, the tone from the top, the, the kind of accountabilities and expectations in our leadership team to support IND. Um, we have a huge focus on partnership in our ecosystem. So not only our law for, firms, but what associations exist globally that can help us get connected to um, like good work in IND. How can we build up our external presence and, and really collaborate on, on meaningful programs? So for example, Diversity Lab is an incubator that um, set up our diversity certification Mansfield in the US. They bring us a lot of opportunities to, to get involved across a breadth of things related to IND. Um, the, another one that is, is worth noting is the um, Leadership Council of Legal Diversity. 
um, which our, our GC sits on the board. And again, it, it, it's driving that accountability and external commitment um, to our IND programs. Um, and then the, the last one that I will kind of draw attention to is our ethnicity program, which is, is probably the newest program that we've established um, this summer off the back of the civil unrest and all of the, um, the, the issues in the US and specifically driven off of the murder of George Floyd. We had a huge outpour and desire to you know, drive change in the space. We saw commitments being made globally to um, address the, the challenges specifically related to ethnicity. Um, Headcount goals were established and across the organization for the US, UK, and South Africa. But within legal, we really wanted to take a, a, a closer look as to what we could do to um, address some of the systemic bias that we know exists within any organization. Um, so we set up an ethnicity program about 40 volunteers and a few consultants who are, are focused on kind of the, the IND and organizational change agenda. And we've looked across how do we drive better accountability of our headcount goals? How do we improve and de-bias any processes that we have related to recruitment, retention, promotion, uh, establishing an inclusive culture? So we, we have a huge undertaking as part of this program, but it's been hugely engaging for our people to really proactively participate in and we're we're excited about being able to do something specifically for legal to to make an impact so i'll pause there we have a lot of programs but i would say those are the key ones that are really helping to further our agenda wow thanks crystal that that's really really fantastic it sounds like there's a lot going on at accenture and we will be hearing more about that as we go through today's event but let's move over to Jennifer. What's, what's UPS's approach to diversity and inclusion? You know, as one of the world's largest logistics services provider and industry leaders in trade. Yeah, absolutely. So I would start off by noting that UPS is very much a values-based company. It is something that stood out to me when I first joined the company and I certainly um, held true um, during my time here. Um, we are a company that has a long-standing commitment to investing in people, in communities, and diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, we operate in 220 countries and territories around the world. And so it is important that we ensure that we are not only serving our communities, but that our workforce reflects the communities in which we serve. And so with that in mind, DNI, DE and I is not only a core value, but a business strategy for UPS. We, we know that if we look like our customers and the communities that we serve, it is a better experience for all parties involved. And so I would say our approach really starts at the top with our most senior leaders. And it includes everything you know, from investing in programs, partnerships, um, uh, some of which you know, Crystal mentioned, organizations and our employees, our UPSers. Um, one example I would you know, mention is our UPS Women Exporters Program, which is a global initiative that aims to empower women-owned businesses to take their products across borders, export around the globe, and increase their market share. So we're excited about leveraging our global trade expertise to help women entrepreneurs access new markets, especially now, you know, when we know that women entrepreneurs are among those that have been impacted the most during the pandemic. Um, you know, so, and that is a program that's being run across the world, including in, in the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Um, so that's, that's one example of an approach from an external perspective. Um, and just briefly to mention an internal approach, I'd highlight our business resource groups, our BRGs, um, like our Women's Leadership Development BRG, our LGBT and Allies BRG, African American, Asian American, Asian BRGs. These are employee UPS employee groups that really serve as an extension of the company's broader DE and I strategy and foster a culture of inclusivity. Um, so I would say, you know, our approach is is diverse, but it's very much values and business strategy based, and it definitely starts from the top. And that's something that I really um, and proud of about our company and our approach. Wow, what a great perspective. I like that it's part of the strategy and that you guys have you know, resource groups that are employee run, which it sounds like more than one company does. So that's fantastic to hear about. 
And Danielle, what about in your experience uh, working for the government? What do, you, what do you see as the main benefits of an inclusive and diverse culture within the legal sector? Yeah, thank Courtney. So I think there's kind of two elements I wanted to discuss in relation to the benefits. So I think firstly, coming from an in-house legal team, I think there's the, the benefits of having a diverse team within your in-house department. So I think, you know, there's, there's huge benefits from being able to actually work within a, a diverse environment when it comes to innovation, when it comes to engagement, and when it comes to actually providing effective legal services. So I think from, from that perspective, it's important that you actually create that diversity in-house. And I think in my experience in the region has really sort of taught me firsthand the benefits of having that diversity. I think in particular in the UAE, we are in a, a very diverse region, you know, with um, we work with people from every different type of jurisdiction. And I think that understanding how different people perceive different communicate or understand different communication, how things can be communicated effectively, how difficult uh, discussions can be managed, all can benefit from having the diversity in-house to have those discussions. So what I've learned from my colleagues at ADNOC, you know, discussing around the table has been invaluable in terms of actually taking the messaging and how we approach the delivery of legal services and adapting it and changing it and actually taking on board that people receive things differently. So from that perspective in-house, I think there's just no doubt that a diverse team will really help you deliver effectively and, and take the business along with you and build building these really positive relationships. From the external counsel side, I, I think it's becoming increasingly important that we start to see diverse teams in the, in the law firms that we engage with. You know, our in-house business team, our business teams are, are, are used to a more diverse in-house team, and they do expect that now when they, they engage external counsel on our projects. So I think, you know, where we see less diverse teams, you know, we get concerns raised from the business, you know, are they going to understand us? Are they going to understand the region? Are they going to understand the political, the cultural sensitivities? Um, so I think where league law firms turn up with more of diversity within their teams, you know, that's extremely well received. I think it creates a really positive get, you know, sort of engagement from the outset. And I think it's really starting to become a kind of differentiating factor uh, for us in terms of who, who we work with. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear about, you know, how how you guys are focusing on this internally, but also externally. So it's interesting to hear that the business puts pressure on external law firms, for example, and what they're doing to, to include and be inclusive and um, within their profession. So that's great. So I, on that note, we'll turn it over to Mark and gender equality is an important element, Mark, of DE&I. Can you talk a little bit about some initiatives you're doing or considering at Clyde & Co in the UAE? Yeah, so it, actually it's very interesting to hear from, from Danielle and from Jennifer about um, what's happening in their organisations and how that's helping to drive what we're doing within law firms. I think it's fair to say that, that the legal profession in, in private practice at least is probably quite a way behind and listening to some of the in initiatives um, from Jennifer and from Crystal there, I, I think there's a lot we can learn, um, learn from the organisations that we engage with. And certainly having that drive from our clients to, to pay more attention to this helps us internally um, to, to, to get some focus on, on the issues um, that arise. Um, in terms of the way that, that we do things um, at Clyde Co, we have a, a regional um, diversity and inclusion committee, um, which is a steering group really made up of a number of partners and, and other senior um, people within the firm. But more importantly, beyond that, we have both gender and cultural diversity groups, which are made up of members of teams all over the, the business, so not just from, from management. And that's really important for us in ensuring that we have diversity within those groups uh, and that actually, you know, diverse, diver, not just for diversity culturally or, or from a gender perspective, but also diversity of thought and approach. Um, and that's obviously very important to, to drive the agenda. In terms of um, gender diversity specifically, we have um, a women in business group which um, has recently been reactivated um, after after some time. Even during COVID times, it's been kind of difficult to get get things going again at times. But um, but we have a very committed group that are engaging with the wider with, with clients and the wider community and pushing gender initiatives. 
Um, we're obviously um, very conscious of the fact that the makeup of law firms historically has not been balanced. Um, and so through recruitment and so on, we're, we're looking at uh, um, implementing policies to ensure that we get a balance of candidates, to ensure that we're, we're considering candidates from, from various backgrounds, be that uh, gender, diverse, uh, cultural diversity or anything else. Um, we've engaged in um, a program um, looking at unconscious bias within our leadership group, but also throughout the firm, which I think is very important to, to start to unpick um, those unconscious bias uh, um, issues that arise uh, probably for all of us. And actually, that was a real eye opener to be involved in a session and start to challenge the way that we do things. Um, both from, from gender perspective, cultural perspective, and, and, and the other. Um, we've recently started engaging with our clients a bit more closely and conducting one-to-one -one sessions to really understand what drives their initiatives, what they're looking for in their legal counsel. Um, we have a very committed group of people within the firm who, who want to change the way that we do things, change the makeup of the firm, but it's even more helpful when we hear from clients and understand that actually there's a real commercial driver for that change as well, that, that it's not only um, something that we should be doing that's of itself a, a good thing, but the fact that clients are asking us to, to show that we're paying attention to these issues. Um, and so often we'll be asked, I think we're going to come on to, to this topic maybe a bit later, but, but we're asked you know, from our, our clients, as Danielle was, was mentioning, um, what are we doing in this space? What's the makeup of the team? Um, you know, we've we've been told recently, um, you know, we don't want uh, white men in blue suits um, to be working on our matters solely. We want to see a diverse group, and that that obviously adds to the quality of the advice that we can give to our clients. Yeah, thank you, Mark. That's great. And and so keeping with the concept of gender inclusion, Jennifer, you know, less than a year ago, UPS crossed a huge milestone. In the first time in 113 years of the company, they appointed a female CEO. So can you discuss what your company, I know we touched on this a little bit, um, what you guys view as the greatest benefits of diversity and inclusion, whether it's specific to gender or not at all levels of the organization? Yes, absolutely. Um, so among many other reasons, and besides, you know, as many people have mentioned, just being the right thing to do, um, you know, research shows that DE and I, you know, as Mark mentioned, it results in, in the free flow of fresh ideas. It enables us to solve problems better, you know, especially as legal professionals. And from a company-wide perspective, it's it's good for business. It, it has a direct impact on the bottom line. Um, and I would like to share just some statistics um, with the group. So McKinsey research shows uh, a study found that companies in the top quartile for gender diversity in their executive teams were 21% more likely to have above average profitability than teams and companies in the fourth quartile. And for ethnic and cultural diversity, top quartile, quartile companies were 33% more likely to outperform on profitability. You know, so I think those, you know, those statistics alone just show that there's a clear or a clear indication of the importance of DE and I, you know, and the and the impact that it has directly on the bottom line. Um, another uh, great benefit that um, I see is just the sense of belonging and inclusivity. Um, so if I if I can, I'd like to share just an, an analogy that I did not come up with myself, but I think it does a really good job of illustrating. DE and I and the distinction between diversity, equity, and inclusion. So if you think about um, planning a fabulous party, pre-pandemic, of course, uh, <laughs> diversity is the guest list, right? You want to make sure you have a variety of people there, all fantastic people representing different genders, ages, you know, races. Diversity is the guest list, right? Then you move to inclusion. Inclusion is making sure that your diverse guests aren't just hanging out by the walls. Everyone is invited to dance, right? And the last piece is, is equity. So everyone is asked to dance, but did everyone hear the music that they wanted to hear? Did they hear something that meant something to them? That's equity. And the essence of belonging and inclusivity 
is that feeling that the guests leave with long after they've left the party, right? It's that feeling that I was seen, I was heard, I had a great time, and I want to go back. <laughs> and that sense of belonging is, you know, what companies like UPS are striving to create as a benefit of DE and I, and I think that's, you know, one of the one of the greatest benefits that I've, you know, personally been on the receiving end based on the efforts, you know, that I've seen of, of our company. Um, so those are just a, a couple examples. I love that analogy. That's great. I'm going to have to get that from you later. So yes, <laughs> that's fantastic. Pay her, pay her. <laughs> so Mark, you know, on that note, I wanted to just pivot back to you. You mentioned that your clients are requesting information on how your firm is meeting DNI targets. Can you ex give us maybe an example or talk in, in general about your experiences on whether you guys have been selected or not selected for specific jobs based on your, you know, DEI initiatives or programs? Yeah, it, it's actually very difficult often to know um, to know if you've been selected because of your your position on diversity or the initiatives that you that you have, but certainly. Um, we are seeing that this is part of, of the process of, of pitching for new work um, pretty much in 100% of, of cases. So it's it's very unusual not to find a question on diversity um, to the point where we, we're being asked to show the split of, of time spent on, on client matters um, to understand you know, the diversity of, of the groups working on on those files and, and clients will rightly challenge us on, on those things. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we, we've been engaging with our clients to understand precisely what it is that, that drives um, their selection of, of legal services. And, and, and as, as Jennifer mentioned earlier, you know, the, the need to reflect their, their customers, we, we have the same need to reflect our clients um, and ensure that the makeup of the teams that we, that we put on matters are, are reflective of the diversity that we see in our clients and the need of our clients. Um, as to whether we've lost any work, um, I'm sure most firms probably have at, at some point. As I, as I said earlier, I think it's, it's you know, we're playing catch up to some extent, but I, but I do see firms being a bit more aggressive now. I think there was probably a bit of caution um, in, and I think there is a, hesit a natural hesitance perhaps amongst law firms who, who are still not entirely balanced perhaps to, to shout too much about the improvements they've made because perhaps they don't stack up so well against some of the more advanced clients that we have. But I think um, there is a recognition amongst our clients that, that firms are, are, are moving in the right direction and trying to, to advance their own position in terms of, of diversity. Um, so I think, you know, overall it's having an impact on how we sell ourselves. I think we're we're much more conscious of, of, of ensuring that we sell ourselves based on the diversity that we have in the firm. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the need to ensure that our recruitment policies are right to, to get the right people into our firm to ensure that we meet the needs of our clients is also very important. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sure we've won work. Maybe we've lost work. But I think the, the main takeaway really for us as a law firm is that um, we have to keep striving to meet the needs of our clients and the needs of our clients right now one of those those top needs is, is to ensure that we're taking care of, of, of this area. Yeah, I, I can certainly appreciate that. I mean, I appreciate all your initiatives and that it may be difficult to judge sometimes how clients are perceiving your programs and whether they're making those value judgments on that basis. But, you know, Crystal talked about this a little bit and I wanna, wanna switch back to her for a moment. Crystal, can you talk a little bit more from your company's perspective? Your, procure, your procurement program was recently revamped as to the selection of law firms based on diversity, equality, and inclusion criteria. Can you give us a little bit more background on that? Yeah, and, and I guess just to, to Mark's point, I, I wouldn't say that we have a prescriptive checklist that says we have these expectations, otherwise we're not going to award work, but I think it's, it's been a, a more of a, an evolution of, of where we've gone, come from where we've gone. So I guess as, as context, um, in 2019, when this IND advisory committee was kind of set up, this was one of the topics that we, we wanted to address because I think um, folks may be more familiar, uh, Americans based in the US, where there was, there was an open letter that was written off the back of you know, a load of people acknowledging a law firm had posted a, um, a promotion list and it was all white male. And, you know, there was an outcry and an outpour of, you know, this is unacceptable. And 
um, you know, GCs in, in um, in-house law firms have, um, you know, an obligation to do something and they're in a really good position if you are spending hundreds of millions of dollars in with law firms, you have the real ability to influence what is happening in those law firms. So let's use our buying power to start making a difference and start moving the industry along. So I think there was a real motivation and desire there to do something different, but at the same time, we didn't know exactly what we needed to do. So we, we did a pilot with our um, law firm partners that are we spent the most with in the UK and the US. And we basically said, you know, uh, here's a benchmark, right? Oh, the, the, the data tells us that we should have representation that looks like this. This is what we currently have on our matters. How do we get there? And we know that some of this is our own buying patterns, repeat buying, you know, from the same people over and over again, that that's something that we need to change. And we acknowledge that and thought about how we could reinforce and drive our own people to think differently about how they bought services, but also just having open conversations on an ongoing basis with senior partners um, on our matters to say, you know, what can we do here? What, what is it that you are doing to help drive diversity within your own organization? How can we collaborate together to help, you know, invest in your people to give them the ability to work on our matters? Like what, what is the collaborative effort that we have to make? And I think um, that coupled with the, the kind of goals of we want to see an increase of representation specifically that we can track um, through billing hours was, was a great start. Um, and the feedback that we got from law firms was, you know, it, it challenged us to think about diversity as a business imperative, as opposed to a nice thing to have. Um, you know, it, 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 for many of our, of our senior um, counterparts in law firms, it was an area that they hadn't even explored or understood. It made them have to be more educated on what programs they did have in place. So it was really bringing them along on that journey as well to understand that this is a different conversation than what we've had before and it is an expectation. So we, we got a lot of learnings from that pilot program. We rolled this kind of, we have a, particularly in the US and the UK targets, um, if you will, for representation of, on our matters. Um, we are, have changed the conversation on our annual reviews to spend at least half of the time on the topic of diversity. What are the metrics? What are you doing? What can we do? We've rolled out, we've, we've changed our um, awards program to be purely focused on diversity. So what, what is it that you are doing to promote diversity? What do the metrics look like? What is your thought leadership? We, we've recently um, published our, the, the, the winners jointly in the Wall Street Journal this year. So we're really trying to, in the first instance, positively reward and recognize our firms who are partnering and really um, uh, committed to this topic in the same way that we are. And we are trying to work through our own leadership team to set that expectation again. So it is seen as a business imperative. So it's not Crystal who has a, a role in I and D that is, is shepherding the conversation, but really just trying to, to change that conversation. And the reality is it's early days. So we, we can't bring out the stick and say, we're gonna take away all the work because it's it's a, a collaboration, but you know, we're on that path and, and we, we do expect something different. Right, thank you. And <clears throat> I, I hear you that it's early days, but it really sounds like a lot of progress is being made, right? And it's it's you're right about the points that uh for instance companies have a great deal of power to influence the conversation with respect to law firms if they're the one expending the resources but it sounds like from this conversation too that companies law firms governments are taking it within their own hands right and seeing it as a, sort of a, an important imperative to move forward so that's really excellent i want to i want to focus for a minute now danielle on the government right and uae specific uae what what is, as one of the largest government agencies, what are you guys doing to incorporate your DEI initiatives with, along with amateurization in the UAE? Can you talk about that? Yes, definitely. So um, at ADNOC at the moment, we have a real focus on both amortization um, in terms of increasing our Emirati workforce, 
but also gender diversity. So we have a real focus on female leadership and increasing our female represent representation on the boards of the ad hoc companies. So that combined with emiratization has really led to a focus on the progression of our Emirati female colleagues. And uh, this corporate agenda now has, re has really increased the number of, of Emirati women holding significant positions and the numbers of females in, in senior management positions and our, on our boards. So that's really been a brilliant drive that has come top down from our management to, to see that happen. Within the legal team, we, we have a real focus at the moment on diversity and how that also relates to Emirati so what we found is sort of historically our Emirati legal colleagues, colleagues have often um, qualified in the in UAE law, which means that they've then focused in terms of their area of work on litigation, local law advisory type work. However, as an organization, we are doing more and more sort of larger transactional work, uh, corporate deals, corporate transactions, and a lot of uh, commercial contracting. And so what we found is that as we're doing more and more and work in that space, the teams that we have working on that in-house aren't as diverse as, as we'd like them to be. And, and we don't have the, the representation from our Emirati colleagues that we would like to have in these areas. So at the moment, we're really focused on trying to develop training programs and opportunities um, for our Emirati graduates and scholars to, to, to allow them to qualify in different jurisdictions in the UK, US or the UK, gain experience with our international law firms so that they can get a foundation that allows them then to come back to ADNOC and, and be able to advise on, on more, more broadly across the different types of work that we do. So that's something we're really focused on. And I think that will help us then, you know, present, you know, really real diverse teams within the, within the in-house space, um, especially in the areas of emiratization, which like I say, is, is a real focus, uh, both for the company, but also for, for the more generally. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Thanks for sharing that. And, and pivoting now back from the government entities, Jennifer, to you as one of the largest logistics companies. And you mentioned you serve in over 220 countries around the world. Has, has UPS experienced tangible progress in DEI? Can you explain that? Has that changed over the past year or so? Yes, I would say, you know, I personally have been encouraged by the progress that I've um, seen our company make over the past year. Um, you know, so as you mentioned, we welcomed our new incredible CEO, Carol Tomei, in June of last year, you know, really at the height of the pandemic and in the wake of, you know, a lot of social, you know, injustice. And I'll start by noting that, you know, truly as an example of top down, on her first official day as CEO, Carol's first message to the organization was a video message stating that we will not stand idly, stand by idly on the sidelines of issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And she called us to action, to join her in turning our anger into action. And I would say that under her leadership, you know, I've just really been encouraged by seeing that we've done just that. So uh, some examples, within the past year, we've created a new chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer role held by Charlene Thomas, which reports directly to Carol as the CEO. Um, and I think that's important, you know, that direct, direct line, instead of being, you know, tucked under HR or the, the UPS Foundation, there's a, a role that reports directly into Carol that's focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We also increased the diversity of our board of directors. 40% are women, 25% are diverse. Our executive leadership team is now more diverse. 33% are women, 33% are diverse. Um, you know, thinking back to those statistics about the benefits and have that direct impact on the bottom line, um, you know, I think those changes are a great example of that. Um, we've established a new equity, justice, and action task force that is charged with, you know, essentially identifying and expediting solutions that strengthen the organization, both internally and externally on, on these issues. We've updated our appearance policy to be more inclusive and, you know, really the list can go on and on. Um, if, if I can, I'd like to also highlight the progress and efforts of the UPS legal department. So as, you know, like Crystal mentioned, we recognize that as an in-house legal department, we are uniquely positioned to create an impact on the diversity of the legal profession in a number of ways. And so from an internal perspective, for example, we have a legal 
uh, Legal Department Diversity and Inclusion Committee that is focused on facilitating awareness of diversity related issues, hosting programs to connect diverse firms and um, you know attorneys and resources with in-house attorneys. And we're overall just being a lot more intentional. From a pipeline perspective, we've focused our corporate legal internship opportunities on partnering with diversity focused intern programs. Um, Crystal, Crystal mentioned LCLD. We, we host an LCLD Leadership Council on Legal Diversity and LCLD intern to foster the pipeline of diverse law students. And we've seen tremendous success with those efforts. Uh, and then last but not least, looking from an external perspective, as, as many have mentioned, um, you know, based on our relationship with our, par our partner law firms, we have implemented new outside council diversity guidelines and announced last year new outside council diversity goals. And that is by 2022, minority attorneys should account for 30% of all hours billed and women attorneys should account for 50% of all hours billed. Um, again, you know, I think there's a saying, you know, what gets measured matters. And I, so, you know, the fact that we've implemented these goals, I think, you know, really illustrates that this is a value of our department and of our company. And we, you know, expect our law firms, you know, serving as an extension of us to share that same value. And so, you know, while not perfect, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged to think these actions ensure that we are doing our part as an organization and as a department to be on the right side. Of, of progress in this area. So I've absolutely seen progress over the past year and am encouraged um, by what's been, encouraged by what's been done and look forward to, you know, continuing to make more progress. Yeah, not only progress, but I mean, you really do have some tangible measurements. So that's fantastic. Uh -huh. From incorporating things into your policies to, you know, the, the percentages that you can quote around the your inclusive environment. So that's fantastic. Um, Crystal, Back to you, because I want to hear more about the Mansfield rule and the law firm certification program before we pivot to, to wrap up. Can you give us a little bit of background about the Mansfield rule? Uh, yes. Yeah. So as part of our outside counsel pilot program, we actually found out that a number of our law firms, particularly in the U.S., had signed on to this diversity certification. And really, it's, it is driving at changing kind of the, the systemic processes that we put in place, putting more systemic processes in place to ensure kind of equitable um, people processes. So whether it's recruiting, uh, promotion, um, how work is allocated um, and how we engage outside counsel, it's basically a 50% diverse slate is, is the rule. So it's, it's quite easy to remember in that regard. So any decisions related to, to people in leadership should have 50% of, of the people being considered to be diverse. So in, in many cases, HR is helping us administer these things, but it, it's not about um, you know, giving the work to a diverse person. It's about creating you know, equitable opportunities really. Um, and, and it's been great because it's helped us even drive that culture and, and getting people to think about why it's important and what is actually happening in the organization that maybe isn't, um, you know, you, you, you don't necessarily think about friends of mine. How am I awarding this work? How am I, you know, thinking about promotions and succession planning, et cetera. So it's been great um, from that perspective. So it is a two-year program for certification of which we have to um, be able to explain how we are compliant, how we are measuring all the different criteria that they have. Um, one of which is, is outside counsel um, representation and ensuring that there's, again, a, a slate of candidates that are being considered specifically for leadership, but we've gone ahead and applied it across the whole pyramid of work. And we are asking our law firms to attest and to uh, report actuals so that we can ensure that that is happening. So it is really down to the law firms to be honest with us um, in terms of how they are selecting candidates to come work on our matters. Um, but we are also giving messaging to our own people that this is an expectation and we should be thinking about whether or not we are doing, you know, we are considering a, a, a diverse set of candidates. So that's the, the Mansfield uh, rule. And I'd say in the Middle East, we've, we've already seen um, a, a lot of focus, particularly on outside counsel and, and how we 
bring in that wider diversity. There's a number of programs more recently working with local procurement to identify some of the smaller women-owned firms and get them onto our panel. And again, help them to, to know how we work and make them successful um, because it is not always the case. We, we tend to work with large law firms, but what steps can we take to, to help widen the, um, the funnel as to who we work with? Um, you know, it's really what we're trying to achieve with Mansfield. It is US specific at the moment, we're looking to, to bring it to the UK and then we need to think about how could we expand it globally? Because as, as everyone knows here, diversity looks different in different countries, but how do we implement something similar to, to get that mindset um, in place for our people? All right, looking forward to the expansion of, of that, Crystal, thank you. That, thanks everyone, that was really a, a very insightful discussion. These conversations are so important. So before we open the, it up for q and I want to wrap up with each one of the panelists giving us their top three takeaways on how we each can play a role in successfully contributing to the DEI agenda. That's not necessarily only in work, but also in your personal life. So feel free to, to touch on both aspects if you feel. Danielle, can we start with you? Yeah. Um, so I think I think firstly with with, with this that there's an element it has to be you practice what you preach right so I think you have to personally be driving diversity within your own team and your own work environment I think once you do that and you see the benefits firsthand of actually working within a diverse environment then it allows for you then to promote those benefits you know within the wider department and within the wider organization. So secondly, I think it's really important that we all spend time actually understanding and reading up and discussing the barriers that are there to, to DE&I. I think, you know, we all experience things very differently based on our backgrounds and our experiences and our perspectives. So I think it may not always be obvious to you that there are barriers that are inherently there. And I think if you understand more about the topic, then you can start to really consider what barriers might be in place within your own work environment and then work out ways to actually remove them. And then I think finally, I think frank and, and open discussions around the challenges around DEI are really important. I, I think it's it's easy for people to shy away from these discussions because they, they can be awkward, they can be challenging. And I think, you know, people are sometimes so worried about saying the wrong thing that they just avoid talking about it entirely. And I think that that's actually really unhelpful. So I think, you know, I think it's important that we all open like the channel for communication I think it's important that these conversations are had with everyone. You know, I think, you know, we have to be having these conversations with men around the table, with everyone from different backgrounds so that they feel part of this, of this discussion. And it doesn't just feel like certain, certain people are driving it because then I don't think you take everyone along with you. And I think that applies both in your work environment, but also I think personally, I think, you know, it's important within friends and within groups to just have these conversations and, and challenge yourself on, on perception and things and, and hear the different perspectives because it's just such an incredible learning experience when you hear hear these different perspectives and then you can apply them across all areas of your life. Thanks, Danielle. Appreciate that. Mark, can you give us your three takeaways? Oh, and, and actually some very kind of similar themes. I think the first one, one for me is, is to be involved. I think um, don't assume that you don't have a place, similar to, to Danielle's point, um, don't assume that you don't have a place in the conversation, even if that particular issue maybe doesn't impact you directly or you don't feel that it impacts you directly. I think it is important that everybody's involved in the conversation, um, as Danielle mentioned. Um, I think, secondly, don't assume you know the answer. If, 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 it's, somewhat, if, it, if it's something that doesn't impact you directly, um, don't assume you, you understand the challenge. I think there's, if you think about gender, for example, I think there's lots of talk around retention of good people in, in organizations like mine. And generally speaking, the conversation happens around childcare or making, uh, life choices about parenting and actually the, the issues are, are much deeper than that and I think making assumptions about what the challenges are 
are for 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 women in that situation i think is 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 you know dangerous and i think exploring what what it really feels like to be in that position and then trying to be part of the conversation to fix those things i think is really important um and i think thirdly speaking up and i think in legal organizations i think that's quite difficult at times i think the environment that has been um i guess in place for years um makes it difficult to challenge i think we have a younger generation of people coming through who have a very different perception um, of how important these issues are. And I think perhaps don't feel necessarily that they have the platform to speak up. And I think having the courage to speak up uh, when you see something happening in an organization that, that doesn't align with your values and your belief system um, is really important. I think the more people that do that and involve themselves in the conversation, the better position will be in uh, sooner so um similar similar kind of themes i think being involved being authentic i think that's really important yeah interesting so you know danielle you mentioned you may not know barriers exist and then mark you talked about don't make assumptions so i think those are our pretty key points crystal can you give us your three takeaways please yeah i i, I love that i love what everybody's what danielle and mark have said i think the my first point like i've, I've spoken a lot about our global programs but i think you know even when I go around the world and speak to different people about what they're doing, the issues are are unique, right? They're they're specific to a country, they're specific to a culture, they're specific to an individual. So I think it's important that we, you know, as part of this work, and, and as Mark and Danielle have said, we really seek to understand what the unique challenges are that exist with just immediately around us and not paint the broad brush of, of assuming that we understand what those challenges are. And I think it's great to have global programs because it sets the tone and expectation for a wider culture. But I think it's equally as important to have the, the specific focus that you get, you know, whether it, it's about the, the, the challenges to, to recruit a certain group or nationality, you know, that might be very specific to the Middle East. And, and it's important that we have a lot of focus on that. And I think particularly being in a multinational, it's very easy to lose sight of that. Um, so we just need to be inclusive in that regard. I think that the second point, which um, Danielle said, stole my thunder, which what doesn't get uh, measured doesn't get managed. And like I, I previously in, in my life was not involved in, in IND because I, I wasn't seeing measurable change. I wasn't seeing really, um, you know, focused work. And I think that hopefully the conversation is changing and this is a, a much greater opportunity to, to make change. But I think, you know, we have to, to question ourselves, what are we trying to achieve and what is our goalpost? And we need to be happy to follow through in ensuring that, that we get there. Um, and then the last point is, is really just what I've, what I've seen in my organization is how important tone from the top is. And we've all heard and understood, you know, this is not the work of, of, of a few, of a few diverse people. It's really the, the obligation of, of everyone in the organization and the, the expectation being set from the top has really given us that pa open path to, to drive this work forward. And I think it's so important and without it, we, we would struggle to be successful. So I think it's, it's critical to have in a, a successful IND program. Thanks, Crystal. I, I know we're running out of time here, but I did want to just highlight one thing that you said about measurable change. And I think that really is an important thing, right? And Jennifer, UPS seems to have some really great examples of measurable change. Can you just really quickly give us your three takeaways, please? Yes, absolutely. Um, so similar themes that have already been just mentioned. So I'll be quick. Um, you know, like Danielle said, practice what you preach. Lead by example, be the change. You know, take pause before making certain decisions or, you know, reacting because, you know, try to challenge your own internal biases because we all have them. Um, the second would be, you know, be, then be a champion. So educate and empower others and have those courageous conversations. The third um, would be to mentor and be intentional about paying it forward and trying to create opportunities for others, especially those that may be underrepresented. You know, so I've personally been on the receiving end of great mentorship by people that look like me and people that didn't. And I know that I owe a lot of my success to the fact that others were intentional about mentoring me and making sure that I had fair opportunities. And, you know, so while, you know, I may be the first or the only in some rooms, I think it's important that we're all intentional about trying to make sure that that's not the case going forward. Um, and I think that mentorship is a great way to try to ensure that. 
Um, so those would be my, my three takeaways. Thanks so much, Jennifer. And thanks again to all the panelists. I know I promised Q&A at the end, but it looks like we're running out of time. So I would say, please feel free to reach out to any one of us, uh, reach out to me, any of our panelists, be happy to continue this conversation. And thanks to everyone for joining the event. It's, it's very fascinating to hear the dis different initiatives that are being implemented across the globe within companies, law firms, government, so private and public sector. It's also really inspiring to hear that so much is being done. So thanks again, Liz, any final wrap up? That was a lot of information in a short 50 some odd minutes. What a fantastic program. Uh, thank you all the panelists and thank you to Accenture, Raytheon and UPS for allowing us to have such a stellar group of ladies and gentlemen, give us some good insights on DE&I. Final words to Ms. Struler, please. I think her computer cut out. No problem. So on behalf of Ms. Struler and everyone, including Charles Laubach and our fabulous Legal Affairs Committee and Women in Business Committee, stay safe, stay safe, stay healthy, and join us again soon. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.